first got involved in GA, I suppose, in the local Mullinahone GA club. Like my dad was always involved. He would have played with Mullinahone for years. And then I suppose when we were kids, myself and my brother Paul, he would have been a manager and a selector with the Mullinahone teams that were beginning to have success in junior, intermediate and senior level. So I suppose I was always down in the hurling pitch with him and with my brother and no, a couple of families were there, the current families, Paul Corn went on to play and Captain Tip and so I suppose we that's where we were practicing. We were learning the skills of the game there, watching these seniors train and you no, know, like you had some heroes there like John Lahey who played for Tip, Brian O'Mara would have played for Tip. So we were looking at all these guys and I suppose really we what, what we wanted to be, we were looking at them out in the pitch like, you know. So um but they were really our inspiration and look at they were at home, they were local and I suppose more than one, my local club was having success on the hurling pitch with that, which they hadn't got for years, like winning county finals and contesting county finals. And but that was a great time as a kid, like and I suppose you know, as it rolled on every Sunday you were going to a match. I remember Holy Cross was a place under twenty one county finals, junior county finals, and then you were meeting up with your your friends from school there and the match might be going on, but you were pucking ball on one side of the pitch and you know, that's where the love for it really came. But you know, to answer your question, really, I'd say my dad was really where the love for hurling came, and uh, you know, he really anything we wanted or asked for, you know, to make us play hurling or to help us play hurling, he um he helped out immensely. And you know, you'd always be grateful for that. I suppose that guidance, and you know, it worked out to be a, a you know memorable times uh, playing hurling. My dad would have been the biggest influence, most definitely, you know, and then in the background, my mum would have always helped out with the gear bags and I'd say she was well fed up of us with coming in the back door and dropping the bags and gone again. But, you know, my dad really, um, you know, brought us to the games. I suppose he had his own love for, for hurling and that. So that was a, a massive influence. And so then in Mullinahone, you had John Lahey was probably playing in all Ireland for tip and Brian O'Mara followed on and, you know, Tipperary, teams, I suppose, were now having representatives from our club, Mullinahone, which was, you know, that was another inspiration. You were going watching them play minor and play under 21. And, you know, you wanted to emulate what they had done. And you know, for, for 10 or 15 years in Mulna, in Tipperary, there was always a Mullinahone guy on the team sheet for minor hurling or under 21 hurling, or even for 20 years in, you could say, for, for senior hurling. So, you know, I suppose we all, each generation nearly inspired each other, which is, you know, it often happens it happens in a small rural area. And, um, you know, so we had, we had great times. And then I suppose we were having success in one So, you know, my dad was a massive influence in all that um, for myself and my brother, Paul. Well, I would have first played for Tipperary in the Tony Forrestal tournament in 1994. I was only actually under 12. Um, do you know, so I suppose you would have met a lot of guys there that you would have went on and played under 16 and played minor with. And we had no success in 1994 and I was kind of double jobbing. I was kind of a sub goalkeeper and I came on outfield in the final game. I think I think we might have played Waterford. So we had great success in the year after in 1995 and 1996. We won the Tony Forrestal tournament at both those years. And I was actually captain in 96. And I suppose when you look back now, I played with some of the players then that I went on to play senior with in, in Tipperary. And, you know, I remember in 1993, my brother Paul had actually played with Tipperary that day in the Tony Forrestal tournament. And so had Paddy O'Brien, who went on to play for uh, Tipperary Senior Hurlers, the current Tipperary physio. And I remember bringing the hurley along and looking for a young fella to puck around. And that young fella ended up being John O'Brien, some of my own age, like. So we were only, I'd say, what were we? They were 14. We might have been maybe 10 or 11. And we went on to become very good friends. And we actually won an All-Ireland together in 2001 and in 2010 with Tipperary. And to this day, we're still friends and family friends. Like So just goes to show the hurl and what it can lead to friendships. And, you know, John was probably there looking at his brother, Paddy, and wanting to play for Tip. And I was there looking at my brother, Paul, wanted to play for Tip, seeing both of them playing with Tipperary under 14 on the 14s in the Tony Forrestal tournament. So, so that's where most guys' careers started. And that tournament still runs to this day. And, um, you know, you have some fond memories from then. And the players that would have played in it, you know, sometimes when you see the programme, the players that got player of the tournament or were on winning teams, you know, it's amazing to see the 
careers that they had, be it from Watford to Kenny, Cork, Limerick, no matter where Galway, where they're from, you'd always see the, the players where they started out. And now not everyone starts there, but so that was probably the first time I, I played for Tip and that was probably 1994. Probably I finished up then playing for Tip, you could say senior. My last day was 2014. First time I played in Croke Park was actually in 1997. Um, I played in an all Ireland minor semi final against Galway. I was only 15 at the time, so it was a massive occasion. I remember the new Cusick stand was built. The Hogan stand, the old Hogan stand was there, and we actually togged out in the corner of the Hogan stand, which is where the you see the famous Sherlock Nan. We're going to win to uh, we're going to win that tunnel. That's where they came out. We came out that day, so. We actually were doing very well that day. We were beating Galway about, about five points with a couple of minutes to go. And I remember I was taken off and one or two more guys were taken off and Galway hit two goals and they beat us by a point. But just the whole thing, I'd say, passed us by. It definitely passed me by. I was I didn't play great that day. And the whole day passed me by. And just as I probably even explain to people that, you know, the helter, the helter skelter of even Crow Park and... You know, there's so much going on atmosphere-wise and that the day can pass you by. I remember our hurley carrier, Frank Mayer, um, he came into the restroom afterwards and we were all devastated, looking down at the ground and a few tears in the lad's eyes. And he said, don't worry, lads, he says, we'll get them the next day. And somebody said, what do you mean, Frank? We'll, we'll get them in the replay. And somebody had to say to him, no, we got beaten by a pint. So it just can tell you what can go on, especially as minors. You know, you're very young, lads are only 17, 18, and you know the noise levels are there and the day can pass you by and things can actually happen and you're in the restroom and you realize did that happen and i suppose that's an experience that a lot of young guys first time in crow park would have encountered and you know i suppose that was my first encounter so even though it was supposed to be a, a joyous occasion it probably turned out disappointment but look you learn from your, your experiences and um you know it was you know i suppose there was a little funny story maybe to add and it just explains on the day that things can happen so fast and you know it's um the noise levels that sometimes a game is over and you actually have to ask what what happened what happened there it's just it goes by so quickly when i started out with tipperary would it came up the night before and we would have stayed in in different hotels and balls bridge and that and you know sometimes that helped uh, settle the nerves you know, and um, then as I got older and as my career came towards the, the, the finish, we used to always go up the morning of the game and then you go to a hotel, maybe the Radisson Hotel out in Slorgan, and then you just get the bus in. But I suppose the one memory I have is, you know, when you're on the bus, you're just looking ahead. Like, so you don't even know maybe the directions into Croke Park. So I'd say a few years after that, going to the odd game, I nearly had to see which is the best way into Croke Park after giving maybe 14 years with the seniors, so it just tells you that you're probably getting focused. And I suppose, so the bus can be a, a nervous time because you know you're in your own headspace and you're looking at guys and they maybe have the headphones in or some guys are laughing and joking. Everyone has their different way of dealing with with the occasion. But for me, I think once you got into the dressing room, you just felt it togetherness, and then you felt felt happy. So any of the nerves went out the the door went out the window you just wanted to get out onto the pitch at, at that stage but you know like once you were headed up towards Jones's Road and that and I suppose it all changed then with you know turning in towards the, the Cusick stand side where you had the, the bus park and then sometimes you know you'd hear stories of the bus couldn't fit in so you'd have to park outside in in the in the car park and walk down but you know the nerves would kind of go then like and you know once you see the crowd you kind of know that this is um, a special day and we would have that feeling that you don't want to let temporary people down or let your family down and you know you want to do just as serious all the preparation you've put in as well like and you know i suppose that's that's the whole build up like and it's probably you know it's part you should enjoy but players probably don't enjoy because there is that nervousness there and you know you just everyone wants to go out and perform and, and do well and then you ultimately just want your team to win because if you win and if the thing doesn't go for you on the day, you you hope you get a chance to get back there and get back onto the team and be playing the next day. But, you know, when you look back now, you know, they're, they're, they're great times. And I'm sure for the supporters walk, uh, seeing the bus coming through, a supporter would only love to be on the bus. 
you know. So, you know, it, it, we were, some of us, anyone that played in the county and got to play in Cork Park, we have to look back and say you're, it was a privilege and, you know, you were one of the lucky ones to get that, that, that experience. I suppose everyone has their little kind of routines and habits that they, they do before games. Like, you know, I'd probably change a grip maybe in, in the dressing room just to have a fresh grip. And you know, I, for me, it just maybe killed five or ten minutes. Everyone kind of has a look at the program. So that's probably the way I killed five or ten minutes. And you know, then there's there, as, you, as you got older, you were probably looking to go to the physio table a bit more as well. I was anyway with a couple of injuries. So, you know, you'd knock out 20 or 25 minutes there and... You know, then I suppose you see on the screen in Croke Park that the minor game is over, so you know now it's only 15 or 20 minutes, we'll say, before the ball is going to be thrown in and maybe, what, four or five minutes before you're going to get out onto the pitch. So, you know, that's probably a time then where you just, you know, as a leader maybe on the team, then in, in as you got older, you know, as an experienced player, you know, you might say one or two words or of encouragement to some of the younger guys and so everyone kind of encourages each other then at that stage, just best to look today and you kind of, everyone goes around and everybody just wishing them well and so it's probably just another way of wasting up maybe one or two minutes of that nervous energy and you know all you want to do then is just get out and you know once the manager says his last couple of words you're thrilled then just to be running out the tunnel and once you get out onto the pitch and just strike a ball you're done you know what I mean you're just ready to play and all the nerves are gone and you know so there is maybe you know there's a good hour hour and 20 minutes before a game where you're building it up building it up inside inside in your body and in your your mind and uh you know once it's released then you you're happy just to to get out and play but you know look it's probably it's probably when you think of it now it's probably a you know it's an uncomfortable time before the match and that but um you know it's something special as well and you know once you look around the restroom you're there with guys that you you put into work with and you know it's a uh, you know it's looking back now it's probably a nice time and you know it's something you would miss that that whole build up but definitely it all goes when you get out onto the pitch For me, it was just to get on as many slitters as you can, just find the ball and get pucking. And usually you just get your team picture. And once you've that done, then you're free to go, you know, into your warm up, just get striking, striking balls, hitting them over the bar. You no, know, there's a wind there, see my way the wind is going. You know, and just basically drilling the ball to the guys and getting your touch in. And that's what, that's what players love. That's what hurlers love is just, just hurling. And you know, that's probably the, especially in Crow Park then, you know, you're just finding your distance because, you know, for inter-county players, you know, when you're from Munster and that, you, you don't play up there, you know, every game. You know, so it's, it's, there is always something, you always feel there's something new about it when you get up there. It's amazing, you know, so be it a quarter-final, a semi-final or, or a final. But, um, you know, and the noise levels as each game goes on, semi-final, final, the noise levels get higher and higher and it's harder to hear, guys. But, you know, once you get out the tunnel and just get onto the pitch and see grass, you're happy out and you're just, you're like you're like a child again, I suppose, really doing what you're you're good at and um, you know you're just hoping into for the ball to be thrown in and just try and get on a ball as early as possible. So it's uh, it's all about when you get up there, just to get your hands on the ball for the for in the warm up and even in your, during the game, just to strike it as much as you can. something i don't remember too much i do remember meeting my aunt um she's from limerick bridget moore and then it was her two boys played for limerick as well i remember meeting her um after the match fairly fairly quickly she was there sport in tipperary um i suppose as a 19 year old you probably don't fully understand it to be honest with you um and you probably think this is going to happen that uh, you know it's going to happen regularly which for me it definitely didn't but you know there was definitely Tipperary around that time under the manager Nicky English had kind of been building a team and you know it was special I was calling it forward Lara Corbett was calling it forward the both of us were under 21 at the time Declan Ryan was full forward in so he would have been 33 and that was his last game so you know he had an unbelievable blend of uh, youth and experience definitely in that line and you know you're probably happy for other people more so than yourself because you're 19 um, you know you think your career is never going to end you know, you have no injuries, you have no worries, you're freeze aboard. You know, so I suppose it was just um just, just a joy. I suppose I one memory I have is of the cup afterwards being in the dressing room in the Cusick stand side and everybody gathered around. 
and the cup being just placed in the middle of Tommy Dunn was a captain and you know everyone just arms around each other and just saying this is what all the work was for and this is all the training and you know the sacrifices that we put in and you know so as a 19 year old I think I was probably happy for some of the other guys the Declan Ryans the Tommy Dunn's you know they had played with Tip and have had no success for a couple of years you know obviously Tip won the other in 91 and didn't win again until 2001 so there was 10 barren years there Nick English would have been on those teams he was the captain or he was the manager now and um, John Lahey would have been involved and he was now injured in 2001 Ireland final he was in crutches I think in the dressing room even so you know you have you're probably looking around happy for other people I think is my overriding the emotion of that now of course, you were delighted to win an All Ireland in your first All Ireland medal, and that year for us was a roller coaster year. We won the league, Munster, and the All Ireland. So every game we played, we we won. We went undefeated that season, and I suppose my brother Paul was wing back on the team. So you know, it was a nice family occasion. But as I said, you're you're 19, so you probably fully don't understand it. And you know, it's, I probably understood the 2010 All Ireland better, or it meant maybe more. Because I had went through the hard times, but you know, you come out of there thinking that this is great. Hopefully, we'll have more of these days, and especially in the, in the, in the intercounty game, that doesn't always happen. But you know, I probably remember the celebrations afterwards. You know, as a young fella, sure there were amazing times coming back to Torres and that. But you know, I suppose we accepted the cup too on the pitch in Croke Park. So I suppose your boyhood dream would have always been, you know, be as a player or even as a captain to walk up the steps of the Hogan stand. So it was a different acceptance of the of the cup. But um, look, as a temporary player back then, you didn't care where you got the cup. But you know, it was a different experience. And you know, I suppose the Crow Park was only half been half built then. I remember the Hogan stands was only at the lower tier. I don't even think there was I'm not sure was there. Can I remember was there even. Uh, supporter sitting there but it was it was only the, the start of it being built so it was um you know it was it was it was different but it was it was something you'll uh you know you have great memories from the day and to win an all Ireland at any time with a, a group of a squad of players especially like anything your career you have ups and downs and you know that was probably the case of mine with Tipperary would say we had good days and bad days and probably more bad days than good days but that's what you know when you're getting involved into county hurling. That's what comes with the territory. So you know we had a different array of managers, and we probably played in Croke Park in 05, 06, and 07, and were beaten at the quarter final stage. And you know you can even remember the stadium announcer saying that there's three minutes to go or two minutes to go, and you were nearly always at three points behind, or you were nearly at two points behind. So they were they were hard times to take. But then in 2008, I suppose Liam Sheedy came along as the Tipperary manager and, you know, on the back, I suppose, of the Tipperary Miners winning the other Miners back to back in 2006 and 2007, we had a couple of good players that came into the squad. So, you know, I'll always say it and I always remember Liam Sheedy kind of said that, you know, with this squad, that we're going to go on a journey. So I suppose 2008, we got to the other semi-final, 2009, after winning Monster, 2000. The nine we won Monster and Kilkenny beat us in the All Ireland final. So when we got to 2010, then I suppose so we had built up a lot of hurt and we have we had had our, our disappointments in Croke Park. So you know the 2000 final in the All Ireland final in 2010, then so I suppose we really played with a freedom that day, and you know we took our goal chances in comparison to the year before, and you know we had gained a lot of experience in in the couple of years. You know, and for me then being captain, it was it was extra uh, extra special, and it gave me that chance to to climb the steps in, in Crow Park, and that was probably the end of the journey for that squad because Liam Sheedy stepped down as as manager after that. So we really did go on a, on a journey for those three years, and to finish it off on the the steps of the the Hogan Stand, raising Liam McCarthy, so on behalf of an unbelievable squad that had put in three years of unmerciful training and sacrifices and work and. And we really had a close bond together like that definitely was something special and um you know we had we had spoke about it you know that we were going to leave no stone unturned and i don't think we did you know we really put in a massive effort and you know that was definitely um one of the proudest uh, moments in my my career just even with the squad of players like i was lucky to be chosen as captain because the rule in Tipperary changed before the county champions previous year 
they got to have the captaincy the, the year after. So I was one of the lucky ones. The rules changed. So Liam Sheedy nominated me for captaincy and, you know, I suppose even created a bit of history. I was the first guy from the South Tipperary area, which is predominantly a football area in Tipperary. I was the first guy to, from South Tipperary to, to captain Tipperary to an All-Ireland Hurling final. So, you know, there was a couple of special moments there. And, um, you know, I even met a guy, Seamus Lahey. I know him, you know, he was teaching Rockwell College and he was one of the guys that put that proposal forward at a county board meeting that maybe the captaincy should change. And that was in probably the winter of 2009 and that was passed in for 2010. So, you know, I, I'd often talk to him on the phone sometimes and you know, I'd often say to him, I, I think I can thank you for for uh, the captaincy, but you know, they're, they're just little memories and they're just little stories that add up, I suppose, to, to that day. But, you know, we had the heartbreak of losing to Kilkenny in 2009, the year before. So to beat him in 2010, was special and then you know we probably stopped them with their with their five in a row but um you know that game and that hollering final a lot of people still talk about that and i suppose even pat Kerwick got up to sing the galaxy mountain by afterwards and it really captured the performance we put in that day the spirit we showed and it was the fighting spirit and you know we um we came out victorious but you know for my for my family and for my club on the horn um you know, to be captain that day and, and to climb up the Hogan, the Hogan steps, the Hogan the steps to the Hogan stand was, was definitely extra special and something I suppose I'll never forget. It's definitely different, but I suppose your experience of being there, you can bring that with you and you can bring that even to the, to the dressing room, you know, and like some you get to know players some guys don't like guys talking to them maybe other guys like maybe a word of encouragement so i suppose when you're on a management team or in a backroom team you know you just have to know know your your role number one and know your space or more importantly know someone else's space because some people have their routines and that and you don't want to be pulling them over for a chat or a conversation when you know from seeing them maybe in previous uh, days out what they want to do that could be banging the ball off the wall that might be just maybe you know getting a strapping or just having headspace headspace going in before they they get out onto the pitch but you know look you know even talking to one or two of the players like i know after a game and you know we go to the lounge across from the dressing rooms afterwards and going in there when you've been beaten is not a nice place both teams go in there and you have your food and and you mingle with the, the opposition and that but you know believe me it's and when i the last time i was in there as a player was 2014 after losing the dollar and final replay and you know you knew you weren't going to be back in the dressing room or in crow park again as a player and, but that was probably emotional for me and i probably showed that emotion on one of my crow park tours because the tour brings you in there and I remember I was there with my little fella and I kind of got emotional there saying last time I was in here we were beating an Ireland final and a few memories flood back and the other, the other team is there and everyone is, you know, everyone is, is gracious afterwards, everyone is chatting, but definitely when you're in there as the winners, it's it's special. But when you're in there as the losers, you know, you're disappointed and you know that you have a homecoming and you have um, to go to the banquet that night and you just feel that you've, you know, let down maybe your family or your, your, your supporters, but that's as a player, but... I suppose as a management then, when you're that side of it, you can pass on that information to your players that, you know, just to kind of motivate them or to tell them, look, we don't want to be in there afterwards, lads, and don't you know, be disappointed because they would have went through it as well. But, you know, once you get out onto the pitch then, when you're on the other side of it, we call it the backroom or the management side of it, you're just more focused on looking around, seeing little small things like that. Players maybe are striking the ball well, if it's a free taker or if it's a goalkeeper, you know, if there's a breeze, you're just maybe telling him what oh, way the breeze is flowing. And you know, once you sit up then into the stand and the game starts, you're kind of watching for different things. You're kind of watching for maybe stuff off the ball. You know, maybe if a, if a defender has, you know, lost track of his man or if a forward maybe has scored a point and is admiring the score and is not tracking back, you're kind of looking for little small things like that when you're um, looking looking on as a backroom team member or a management team member but i suppose the big thing as the days get bigger all are in the semi-final and final your voice nearly becomes less uh, and less to the fore because of the crowds the crowds are so big and there's so much noise that sometimes you're not hearing maybe given an instruction 
in we'll say so you know where I was last year for the the All Ireland final and semi final you were you were back in the seat so when management teams would have a structure in place to get a message or two down so it's definitely different and for me you're probably more cooler sitting down definitely as a player you're more in the heat of battle so you know for me looking on from the from the stands you're definitely more more uh, relaxed and and cooler because at the end of the day you can't influence it um physically or anything like that but i suppose a word here or a word there can can change it so it's um it's definitely different but probably uh, I, I don't think anything beats actually playing and being on on the pitch but um you know being involved in a I suppose a professional side like like Tipperary, the way they are under Liam Sheedy at the moment, is definitely the nearest thing you're going to get to it and and experience. And so I'm I'm, I'm lucky to be involved. I'd say it would be the All Ireland final in 2010, and you know it's obvious for obvious reasons. But I suppose it was just the all the hardship you could say and the disappointment that you would have had from 2001 to 2010 and. You know, there was a stage in my career definitely in 05, 06 and 07 where I probably genuinely thought that we might not ever win another All-Ireland. And it was just maybe we didn't have the calibre of players and we had to turn over management. And you know, it was just, we were, like, we at the time we weren't the top team in the Munster. We were definitely behind the Corks and the Waterfords and Kilkenny were the top team throughout then. So, you know, you were looking saying it's going to be very hard to even get to a final and, you know, Thankfully, things changed from 2008 onwards. And as I said, we got an unbelievable group of players in off the Tipperary minor teams of 2006, 2007, special players, special players that were just, and are to this day still backbone the Tipperary team. Like, um, you know, of their generation, they've gone down as some of the finest Tipperary hurlers ever. So, you know, again, I'd say I was lucky from from that side. I was coming to 28, so was Larry Carr, with John O'Brien, Paul Kern, you know, players that were there since since 2001. And, you know, then to win an All-Ireland, I suppose, with that experience, you know, 2010 was definitely one of the most special day days that, that I had there. And, you know, for a lot of the uh, Tipperary people, I think, as I said earlier, it goes down as, as a special day. But for me, it definitely was. And, you know, just from even the heartbreak of losing the final the year before and just to, to get back there. And, you know, it just we had put so much into it. And on the day then, we got goal chances and we took them and we won the game. And the year before, we got goal chances and I did myself and we didn't take them and we lost the game. And it just goes to show that when you're playing Croke Park, if you get the chances, you have to take them. There's no second chance. And you know, it probably goes back to the first conversation I had on here, which is saying like the helter skelter of Croke Park and the drama that can be up there. I saw that involved with Hawkeye in 2014. It's just so unpredictable at times so unpredictable at times and moments and passages of play can can pass players by and pass management by they could often be on the bus afterwards talking about did this happen did that happen who scored that goal it's just it goes so fast and when you know it's, it's a joyous occasion when you're talking about it after winning but when you're after losing then i don't think anyone wants to talk about it. they just want to to get on with it but 2010 winning dollar and final for me was definitely my fondest day in, in croke park but you know I've had some unbelievable days even since going there with Tipperary, being involved in the management side of it and uh, winning the honour and last year ended up with the backroom team. And even this year, 2020, I really enjoyed the honour and club final because I'd always said that I wanted to go to Crow Park to see a Tipperary club team contest the final and hopefully win it. And that didn't happen. The last time a team was in it was in 1993, I think, 94, Tumivara. And... Boris Lee got to the final this year and it was a day that I went with my family and I really enjoyed it. It was just more easy going, walk down Jones's Road, all the Boris Lee supporters were in the Crow Park Hotel and you know they put in a massive performance and they were just beaten by a Ballyhead Shamrocks and they're so well used to and experienced at winning Club all but it was a day that I enjoyed Crow Park so much and it was a, probably a Club all final that meant something, even though it's not your own club, it's a Tipperary club and I had uh, two cousins playing for Burst Lee, which probably made it that bit special, but definitely a day that I really enjoyed. And, you know, maybe it, uh, I'm telling you now the age I'm coming to, but it was it was something special. And, you know, walking out of a Crow Park that day, you know, despite the Burst Lee loss, but you know, the, the experience and the, 
I suppose the joy that they brought to their parish like was was unbelievable. So you know, you'd love someday to experience that at some level with it with a club or especially your own club, be it junior, intermediate or senior or whatever. But it's uh you know, it's it's a special place, Crow Park, and every day you go there you you just say, Well, what an amazing arena. Yeah, there was definitely look, as I said to you, when I was playing our teams was probably, you know, we were third or fourth in the pecking order in Munster and way behind Kilkenny. So, so any time you would have played Galway, Ollie Canning was a, a tough opponent. He had turned from a forward to a defender. So he knew the tricks of the trade well off. And you know, usually a defender would mark you, he'd play out in front of you. So that was a new challenge. But, you know, the Kilkennys of this world will say Tommy Walsh and JJ Laney were just two incredible defenders. You know, just they really were the backbone of that uh, Kilkenny team. And Tommy, for me, was the heartbeat nearly of the team. And, you know, yeah, Jackie Terrell as well was a physical, tough opponent. Like, and, you know, that was even before the likes of you played against Cork. You had, uh, you know, a guy I really had time for, thought he was super, super player, was Wayne Sherlock, a corner back. And then you had Dermot O'Sullivan, full back, Sean O'Gahal being. So, you know, we probably came up against defences. When I was starting out with Tip, that were they were just unbelievable. You know, they were serious defenders. So those couple of players that I mentioned there, they were very hard opponents to break down. And um, you know, I suppose any time we were beaten by those teams, those guys were very influential in in the game. You know, even if they were marking you or if they were into the the back line. So you know, but they were they were top players that definitely uh, definitely stood out for me. Yeah, well, I suppose to the younger players now, the one bit of advice I would be is to be a sponge. Just soak up as much information as you can. And especially now that the game has moved on from when I've, I've started, the sports science to the game now is incredible. And the, di the dietitians, the nutritionists, nutritionists the, if you listen to these guys, not only will they help you in your chosen sport, but they'll actually educate you in life skills. They'll actually educate you for life. And, you know, I suppose if you ask me if I had my time back, like it would maybe even on that side of it, you know, so it's it's probably it's it's an education now being involved in the inter-county uh, set up. Like if if you're willing to learn and that's the thing and if you're willing to soak up all the information and you know, even the top inter-county teams now have and, you know, you have the GPA of all different avenues here that you can get advice, you can get career advice and everyone involved even with inter-county teams now, they're, they're top class people in their own right and they're willing to help like and, and give your time. So I suppose, you know, as Liam Sheedy often says to the very guys, just put your hand up, just put your hands up and ask and we'll help you in any way. And, you know, I suppose it's, it's, that's the thing. So I'd just say be like a sponge and like the one thing you, you, you never stop learning. Even if you're, I'd say, coaching at 60, 70 years of age, you're still learning new new things, new ways. So, you know, never think that you, you know it all because you don't. Definitely not in Ireland so, or, or in, in football and that it's because he's moving so fast. So that would be my one bit of advice. Like, you know, and obviously then for hurling, you just have to have the hurley in your hand all the whole time. You know, as I remember, Paddy Butler was coach us. He said, the hurley has to become an extension of your hand. And he's right, like everywhere you go, you have to have the hurl in your hand and you know you'd often hear stories of some of the tip players that they were always seen going to matches or even around their their local villages with the hurl in their hand and you know that's why they went on to play for tip and that so it's um you know that's that's the, the, they'd be two pieces of my advice and you know the same can apply at club level as well because club teams are getting way more professional now in their approach and that and you know so you can learn you can learn life skills being involved and you know, just being involved, it's, it's, it's great, great experience. I'd, I'd say probably ultimate highlight would be definitely our club won a county final in 2002, Mulnohan, for the first time ever. Um, so I definitely put that up there as probably one of the big highlights. Why? Because it was the first time ever winning it got beaten in the final in 1997 and you know I would have loved even after 2002 I was only 20 the year we won it I would have loved to get back to play in another county final and we got beaten in five or six county semi-finals so I think it just goes to show how hard a championship even the club championship is but you no know, just uh, you know sometimes even when you go down to the local village 
not that you talk about every weekend, but the odd conversation come up and memories that flood back from the match and that day and that night and the day after. And, you know, everyone has a smile on their face when they're talking about it. And you know, people would have came home from England and America for that county final and that. So I would have loved to experience that one more time, most definitely. So for me, that was a big highlight. And, you know, you, you definitely captain and Tipperary to the All-Ireland final then. Uh, in, in 2010 was was right up there as well like but you know when you look back now when you get a bit older and a bit wiser like I suppose when you finish up you are disappointed really that you would have loved to win more Irons and you definitely would and I, any player would you know but like you know the friendships that you would have made and the players you would have played with you know you'd always find to this day when you'd meet some of the guys like you know you Especially when you win an all Ireland, there's obviously a bond there between players and that. You know, you know, you look each other in the eye, you don't say it, but you know you've been involved in something special. And you know, I think it's the friendships you make. It's definitely the friend- friendships that you make. Like they're they're big highlights too, and you can't underestimate that. Like, you know, and look, you'd love to have won seven or eight all Ireland's. And you know, and some days you'd be you know, you'd be saying, Oh, gee, we had our chances and this and that. But look, it wasn't to be and look, we were lucky to win too. And after 2001, when the first is 19 years of age, I thought we did with have more these days and I got to 28 and won the next one. So it's not easy, no matter what county you play with or where you're from, it's, it's very hard. And it's even harder now with the different structure of the championship. It's very hard, very hard to win all now. So, you know, there look, there's a couple of highlights there. And, you know, I suppose, look, staying relatively injury free for most of my inter-county career was, I was lucky. You know, you could have easily got a bad injury maybe after four or five seasons. And you see Shane Dowling retire now with a bad injury, only 27. So, you know, staying injury-free for my inter-county career, uh, relatively injury-free, you know, not getting a really, really bad injury. Had a couple of small injuries, back trouble and that. But, you know, not getting a, a career-threatening injury. Um, look, I was lucky and I keep saying lucky throughout this uh, interview. You know, because I think every intercounty player or every hurler when he goes out, you're vulnerable. You know, I mean, one wrong twist, a wrong, and I've seen it happen being involved in teams and playing with players. And I'm sure that must break their heart, like you know, to have your career cut short. I'm probably after giving you a couple of highlights there, but you know, um, a few special days. But I suppose the one I said first nearly is, is top of the list winning the county final senior hurling in 2002 for the first time ever with my club on the own was definitely one that I'll, I'll never forget. Mm-hmm.